Hi, everybody. I'm Dana McCreesh, and I'm honored to be here to welcome you tonight to Pequot Library's Meet the Author event with Daniel Lowinger. So I live in Southport, and I'm a huge reader, and I've been a big fan of the Pequot Library. And I've been lucky enough to get to work on some things with them, including this Meet the Author Committee, where we bring great authors to you, normally locally, but the upside, if there's any upside of COVID, which is obviously not a no good thing, but the upside is that we can have authors from all over and you can all zoom in and we can have viewers from all over. So welcome. I live in Southport. I have three kids. Uh, my kids are teenagers now, but actually when my son was in kindergarten, I, I'm just gonna tell a little story about how I came to meet Daniel. When my son was in kindergarten, I was at a cocktail party. Was at, we went to Stratton for the weekend and we had, were at a friend's house and they had some friends over and it was one of those parties where the kids are running around and the adults are drinking a little and keeping a loose eye on the kids. And they had this beautiful, beautiful room with the snow and the mountains in the background and this checkers set, one of those gorgeous checkers sets just in the corner. And I was talking to people and all of a sudden out of the corner of my eye, I saw my kindergarten son start playing checkers against a man who was having a drink and talking to a group of people. And then I saw it turn and I saw the man look annoyed. And then I saw, and I was just loosely watching, and then I saw him put his drink down, turn away from the group and really focus. And about two minutes later, I saw him look annoyed again. And then that happened two more times that night. And then right after that, one of the guys came over to me and said, I was playing checkers with your son. He's really got an interesting approach. You need to get him into sailing or chess. And I thought, oh, and then, and I guess it's not as strange as it seems because it was a cocktail party. So there were like-minded people, but that exact thing happened two more times where people came over to me and said, you need to get him into sailing or chess. So I guess it's stuck in my brain. A year or two after that, my son went to sleepaway camp. He tried sailing. He didn't like it. Then he was learning how to move the pieces and how to set up a chessboard from my neighbor, who actually is the husband of Monday's interviewer, Debbie Placey, if any of you were in our amazing Meet the Author on Monday. But he was kind enough to teach Brent how to move the pieces and how to set up the board. And then there was a sign up at school about a chess club. So Brent was in second grade at this point, I signed him up for the chess club at school. Next thing I know, he's going to tournaments, he's studying, he's passionate. And eventually that led us to the chess club of Fairfield County, which is one of the most amazing places akin to Pequot, these gems that we have in our area. And I'll let Daniel tell you about the chess club of Fairfield County, but it is really unique and it's in our backyard. And, and then Brent was lucky enough to have some amazing teachers. And one of, we have Daniel Lowinger here tonight to talk to you about chess and the Queen's Gambit, since everyone is talking about the Queen's Gambit. Um, and that's about it. I had a couple more antidotes, but Daniel really wants questions. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about him, but I want to tell you, if you look on the bottom of your screen, there's a chat piece and a Q and A piece. And please type any questions you have into the chat or the Q&A and he will answer them throughout this presentation. So it is my pleasure to introduce Daniel Lowinger. He's an active chess player. He's a coach. He's a teacher of both chess and Chinese actually. He's a USCF certified life master, which is the highest certified national title. The United States Chess Federation awards the national master title to any player who reaches a rating of 2,200. Less than 1% of rated players hold the title. And obviously 
most chess players aren't rated anyway. Um, a life master is a national master who has played 300 games or more with a rating over 2,200. Daniel's the author of two amazing books on chess strategy. Well, I haven't actually read them because I wouldn't understand them, but I assume that they're amazing books on chess strategy. And he's the co-founder of the Chess Club of Fairfield County. He lives with his wife in Alexandria, Virginia. It's my pleasure on behalf of Pequot Library to welcome Daniel Owinger. Okay, am I on right now? Okay, all right. Um, so hello everybody. Um, I apologize, this is my first time doing something in this format. So um, it's gonna take me a moment maybe to get used to it. But as far as I know, there are some folks here who um, are longtime friends. So, okay, we already have a question. So I'm gonna get to those. Um, and so uh, thank you for joining us. And um, yeah, um, I'm very happy to have some time here to answer your questions. Um, let me just talk a little bit for a few minutes about, uh, about myself, just so you know who, who I am a little bit more. And, um, and then I was asked to talk a little bit about uh, sort of chess culture as I've seen it um, and how it might relate to the show that's very popular now, The Queen's Gambit. Um, but yeah, I'll try to, I'll try to be brief and then, and then if there are questions, we can go through those. So, um, and again, just give me a second here to get used to all of these. <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, I learned the moves of chess from my father when I was five years old. So that was 31 years ago. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, I was very fortunate that in the town that I lived at that time, which was Great Neck, New York, um, sort of near Queens, if you're, if you're from New York, there was a local chess club. Um, but it wasn't a chess club in the way that the chess club of Fairfield County is a chess club. It was a community center where once a week um, they would have a chess, you know, a, a chess club meet. Um, but there were some very good players there and some very nice people there. Um, and they really started to mentor me and coach me. And I'm about to show you um, a photo of, uh, that was taken uh, by the newspaper when I was there at that time. Um, which is something I want to start with, um, because I think it says a lot about uh, about chess culture. Um, but in any event, um, just really fast, uh, I you know started playing competitively first on Long Island, and then um, I was also very fortunate in that in New York, at the time, the most sort of prominent chess club and most history chess club in the country, and still I would say the most history chess club in the country, which is the Marshall Chess Club um, in Manhattan. Uh, was, you know, about an hour uh, or so away from where I lived. And so once I became more serious about chess, I started competing there. And that, you know, for those of you who have seen some other um, chess depictions in popular culture, such as Searching for Bobby Fischer, which was a very famous movie that, that came out um, about chess in New York, um, that chess club had a lot of um, international players and players of international repute. Um, and it was also... Um, a place where in chess history, a lot of great chess players and even world champions and world caliber players had participated. And it was named after an American champion, Frank Marshall, uh, who's very, very famous um, in, in chess history. And so I really sort of got my sea legs at the uh, playing there. Um, and then just as you might've seen from the show, The Queen's Gambit, eventually I started to play, uh, you know, in larger venues um, and it, it sort of gave me exposure just as it did to Beth. Uh, to all kinds of players and people from, from all over the world, which was really um, phen phenomenal for me. Um, and, uh, and then I went to college. I went to college at uh, Amherst College, which is a very small school up in Massachusetts. Um, but we had a chess club and I was the president of the chess club there. And I was able to um, bring students to events and, and, and host some events. And that's really, I would say, when I started to get into the organizing side of things, um, and mainly the thing I was most proud of when I was at Amherst was that we did outreach to the community. And so we would go into the local public schools and we would teach chess to, uh, you know, to underserved kids and, and, and just uh, any kind of kids who were interested in playing chess there. And, um, you know, that was a very meaningful experience for me. And it was, uh, you know, and a chance to connect uh, with the broader community and to do something that um, I think both sides found meaningful. Um, and so when I left college and I got a job teaching in Norwalk, Connecticut, well, actually I was teaching in Westport, uh, if you know Connecticut, I was teaching in Westport, Connecticut, which is uh, right next to Norwalk, Connecticut. Um, so 
not not Southport, but pretty close. <laughs> um, and uh, I was teaching at a small independent school there. And I started the chess club there as well. And um, we started competing in local scholastic tournaments. And then um, eventually we competed in regional tournaments. And then eventually we went to the national championships. Um, and, uh, you know, through, through it all, I continued to um, do some organizing. Um, and there was another organizer in the area who was just a wonderful person uh, who I'll have a chance to talk more about by the name of Melvin Patrick. And we became very close friends. Um, and uh, Melvin, uh, somebody who lived his whole life um, in Norwalk and was really well known to the community. He, he had spent his life sort of giving to the community and also um, running events, um, running chess events. Um, and so we sort of teamed up and that was sort of the um, beginning of the um, concept that we, we came up with that became the chess club of Fairfield County. Um, and I, I appreciate what Dana said about, about it. And, um, you know, even though I've moved now to Virginia, I still visit and um, am involved. And uh, I think it was, you know, for me, a sort of culmination in, in some ways of my journey um, in chess. And I want to talk, I think it'll make a little more sense when I talk about the values that we tried to put into the club and that I think are still embodied by the club um, when uh, I have a chance to go through a little bit more of the talk. Um, so, but I wanted to start with a, a photo because they say that a photo um, or they say a picture, what is it, a picture um, is worth a thousand words. <laughs> okay, so let me share this uh, photo and I'm gonna ask, uh, I'm gonna ask you all in the audience to, um, to do some interactive stuff here. So I just wanna ask you what you see in this photo um, and what you, maybe what you don't see as well, because I think that um, that's equally telling. So I'm gonna share my screen here and here's the photo. And this is me when I was uh, back at the uh, Great Neck Chess Club. Um, I think this is about as big as I can make it. So I apologize for, let me see if I do that. Okay. Um, and so I'll just ask you to, I'll keep it up for about a minute and I'll just ask you to put in the chat um, box, sort of when you look at this photo, um, what does it communicate to you? What do you think of, what does it say to you? Give everybody just a moment to reflect on it. Okay, I see we're getting some answers in here. Very nice. All right, so keep them coming. There's no need to, um, that you, I don't think you have to read the, the text of the article, it's just the photo. Okay, we got quite a few responses here. Let's see what we've got. And we've got some in the Q&A, so let me um, toggle See if I click on, okay, I might have to, let me come out of this. I'm not sure if I can see the Q and A ones. Oh, aha, uh -huh. somebody said only men. Yes, that is a major theme of the, um, that is definitely, definitely major theme. Uh, let me see. Okay, that's a good question. Um, I'll try to address that, the traits that people have. I think that that's, um, sort of part of the main talk here. And then let me see if I can come to the other section where people have, okay, wow, we have a lot. Okay, we've got, um, right, very good. Men and boys only, intensity, very good. Somebody said child prodigy, very good, okay. Um, I think that um, absolutely they are trying to, trying to go for that. That's a sort of very common trope, if you will, in the chess um, mythology or lore. Uh, I can tell you because I know the quote unquote child prodigy very well in this photo that uh, is no prodigy. <laughs> um, but uh, definitely that is, uh, that is something that is being communicated, I think. No chess clocks or score sheets. Okay, that's right. That was a casual, um, casual meeting of the club. No girls or women, right, very good. Um, yes, I think that that really stands out. Um, are both kings on the board? <laughs> yes, I think they are. Um, White looks to be in trouble. Okay, that might be true as well. Uh, my opponent was the better player than I was, um, which I, I, I want to talk about as well. This sort of goes back to the prodigy comment um, because the prodigy, as I say in this photo, which is supposed to be, I think, the person on the right, uh, which is me, um, is, um, you know, uh, I think losing this game. And also every single other person in the photo is a better chess player than I was uh, at the time. Um, 
uh, it's Black's turn, but White's hand is hovering over the clock. Interesting. Yes, I think this was a speed chess game. Um, so there was uh, some of that going on. Intensity, very good. Yeah, I like that. Um, and no people of color. Yes, very good, very good. Yes, um, so I think that that actually hits on a lot of the things that I wanted to talk about. Uh, let me stop my share and I'm gonna take out some of my notes. Oh, I had a couple more, I'm sorry, that were in the Q and A. Um, maybe those are the same as before. Okay, so I don't know. Okay, and somebody asked, have you ever played anyone in the mail or via correspondence game? Um, I have not, that's a good question. Um, I've not been interested in that personally, um, but there is a very thriving um, correspondence chess community. There is, um, good question. Um, and there's a lot of respect paid to those players by um, over the board players uh, because they have more time obviously to consider their moves. And um, so their moves get, get entered into the historical record of games and uh, people um, are very interested in those games. Um, what are they called? I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure I can find that out for you sort of um, what the, what, what the organization is, it's, you know, it's some kind of generic name, I think correspondence. Uh, chess association, something like that. But I, I'll, I can find that out. Um, but let me go back to um, some of these comments about the photo. So, right. So some of the notes that I had, which I think um, are things that you guys mentioned, and then maybe a couple of things that weren't mentioned as much is that it's all male. That was the first thing that, that I mentioned. Um, it was intergenerational. So you might notice that um, there's me, I was uh, obviously very young at the time. I don't remember actually exactly how old I was, um, although I could probably probably figure it out, but I was a child. Uh, the person that I was playing, his name was Dimitri. Uh, he was in high school. I think he was a senior in high school, I think is what it says. And then obviously there were three adults, uh, also of varying ages. Uh, um, there was uh, Joel Salmon, who was, uh, uh, I think he was in his thirties at the time, all the way up to uh, Jason on the right, who was, I think in his 60s or so, uh, maybe uh, around there. So intergenerational, right? Everybody, uh, very different ages, very unusual, I think, to find people of such a wide variance in their ages, all sharing the same space like that. Um, and then I wrote multicultural. Um, now it's true that there were no people of, of color um, in this photo. And I think that there is, um, that that is a sort of an issue for sure. Um, um, but I will say that I am, um, my father is Jewish or identifies as Jewish and my mother is Chinese. Um, so I'm sort of mixed in that way. My opponent, Dimitri, identified as Russian American. Um, the three gentlemen in the back, um, of the three in the back, two of them identified, I believe, at least one of them identified as Jewish. And one of them is a very interesting man, uh, the man in the middle, uh, his name was uh, Bruce, and he was an early mentor of mine, and he was a dual Fran uh, French and American citizen. Um, but if you would ask him, he would identify himself as French. He was um, uh, married to uh, a French woman, and he had committed uh, his career and a good part of his life to um, to being in France and to uh, to um, you know all things French. Um, so so, um, and then there's the intensity of it. Right. Um, so, um, so I have male intergenerational, uh, multicultural, and then this thing about the child prodigy. What I what I said was there's a there's obviously a focus in the photo, right? There's an outsized attention on the youngest the youngest person there, which is me. And I think that's something that you continue to see in the way media covers chess, um, and it's sort of part of the mythology that grows up around chess, is that people are always very fascinated by. Um, you know, and I think I think Dana mentioned this when she was talking about Brent. You know that there's this fascination with uh, children um, and the fact that children can play chess, you know, um, and compete with adults. Um, and and that's often take you know again that's often sort of mythologized in a way as the sort of child prodigy. <laughs> so there are lots and lots of um, you know folks, and and I was I was the one in this picture who sort of get that sort of child prodigy um, treatment. And that, you know, that actually has, I think, um, and again, I'm only speaking from my own experience, but I've seen it because I've been both the recipient of it and also on the other end of it, where I was coaching children for many, many years. And, um, you know, the kind of attention that they receive from adults and the interaction between adults and children um, is very unique in chess. And I don't, 
I think um, there's some positive aspects of that. And there can also be some, some negative aspects of that. Um, and I think that the show, The Queen's Gambit, for those of you who um, have seen the show and have um, been, have your interest peaked from the show, um, uh, I think addresses that. By the way, if I could just ask you all to maybe stick with the chat, because for some reason it's easier for me. I just noticed that there are questions in the Q&A, so I apologize, I didn't notice those before. Um, but I think it would be great if we could just keep them in one venue because if they're on the chat, they just come up right away on my screen. I don't have to specially click on them. Um, and I will promise that I will try to get to all of them by the end. So if they if they coincide with what I'm talking about, I'll try to get them right away. Otherwise, I'll try to save them for just a little bit later. Um, but there's a great question about how why is chest endured for so long, and I'll try to I'll try to get to that at some point. Um, I'm keeping track of the questions. So I'm keeping track of the questions. I'll make sure that you hit them all. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Cause it's uh, a lot of moving parts here for me. Uh, okay. Um, so, but um, I was asked when I came to um, about this talk when I was saying, well, what am I going to talk about? I was asked to sort of talk a little bit about the culture of chess um, and in particular, maybe how it might relate to some of the things that, that I saw when I watched the show that stood out to me. Um, so this is, I think might be a good moment for me to do, uh, to do a plug, but it's going to be a, a, not a traditional plug. So I'm pretty excited to do this because I don't think I've ever done this before, uh, which is that I'm going to um, uh, mention my book by way of saying that um, it's really a, a book that's targeted very specifically at um, players who compete in tournaments. Um, and it's, it's, it's aimed at sort of, um, you know, giving you a little bit of a leg up in certain areas of your game. And so if, if um, my understanding is that this audience for the most part is not, are not folks who are competing in chess tournaments already. Um, and so it's sort of an anti-plug, <laughs> uh, which is my recommendation would be, um, there's, there's no need to buy the book, uh, but, um, but I do hope that if you become interested in uh, interested in the um, the chess world in a deeper level, that maybe you will start to think about um, joining a chess club. And as I said, uh, as I'll get to at the end, um, I hope I'll uh, you know persuade you to some extent that uh, the chess club of Fairfield County, uh, which as Dana said, is right in your backyard, um, is a great place. Um, obviously, now during COVID, you know there's a lot of limitations on on that. But um, when things hopefully get back to normal at some point. Um, you know, that that might be a, a place that you might want to start dipping your toe. Um, okay. Oh, wow. That is a, uh, that is a huge question and an um, uh, amazing question. What typical mistakes do chess parents make? Um, I think that that is, um, I'm going to try to address that as well. That is a big that is a big question. I do think that, um, I do think that everybody uh, just, you know, just, I, as I mentioned, I'll try when we coincide with things I happen to be already talking about, I'll try to mention it. And then at the end, I'll try to get everything else. But this thing about the child prodigy, the mythology that grows up around chess, um, you know, I, I think that um, parents, uh, you know, uh, buy into it, you know, buy into the hype, so to speak. Um, and I, like I said, you know, there's, um, there's positive elements to all of that, I think. And then there's also, uh, you know, some elements that depending on how you manage them might not be so good. So from, from the TV show, for those of you who watched the TV show, you know, one of the things that I, that I connected with, with was the, the intensity, which a lot of people have mentioned. Um, but then there's, there is a sort of inflated, I think, sense of confidence that comes from, you know, being a child and being splashed on the newspaper um, and being um, treated by adults as a peer in many ways, you know, and you, you see that in the show as well. And I, I think there are a lot of positive things that comes that come from that as well. Um, but there's also some risks that are associated with that. And I think that it's really the parents job, you know, uh, speaking about the parents um, to help to help navigate, just like, you know, it's the parent, it's a parent's job. I, not that I'm an expert on being a parent, okay, I'm not here to be an expert on being a parent. But I do think that, you know, um, chess parents, like any parents, you know, want to help their children navigate the the challenges, the psychological challenges, the developmental challenges uh, that they go through. And I think that um, there are some some of those challenges that are unique to being in chess. You know, if you're in a sport, for example, you typically are interacting with children who are your own age. And obviously, there's a range of issues that you have to deal with. You know, with with you know bullying and hierarchies and all sorts of things and sportsmanship. 
Um, and some of those overlap with chess, but one thing that I think is unique about the chess community is this very intergenerational nature. Um, after the chess club would end on, at Great Neck House on Tuesday nights, um, the, the adults would go off to a restaurant and continue playing chess late into the night, way past what a child's bedtime should be. Um, but I was always invited to go along and I always went along. Um, and so my sort of social circle was very unusual um, because, uh, but, but not so unusual for a chess player um, in that I was hanging out late at night with, you know, adults um, and they were sort of treating me like I was a young adult. Um, and I do think that that you know, that there are some, there are some risks associated with that and, and some developmental issues associated with that. And I think that those are well explored in the show. And I think, I think that that's personally, I think that's part of the reason why the show is popular is because it's, it, it does a good job of profiling Beth in a more, I think, um, rich and interesting way than perhaps chess players tend to be depicted. Um, so I connected with that element of it. Um, uh, you know, I think the flip side of having a very high degree of self-confidence when you're young like that is that you also go through periods of, of, of doubt, you know, a very profound doubt, especially uh, when you lose a chess game. And I want to talk about a little bit about why I think that is. Um, Dana had, uh, had talked about how my connection to chess, I think it might have been in the literature um, leading up to the talk. My connection to chess is not, uh, I don't really think of it in terms of a mathematical game. Um, to me, um, my interests are, you know, I majored in philosophy when I went to college, and I'm now a language teacher, as Dana mentioned, I teach Chinese. And, and to me, chess is very much uh, a combination of those two things. It's, it's really, to me, I see it as a language, and I see it as a philosophy in, in, in its true meaning, which is a search for truth. Uh, in fact, um, the most famous chess world champion uh, whose, whose name is most well known in the world is, is Bobby Fischer, Robert Fischer. And that's how he described chess as a search for truth. Um, but before him, there was a world champion who was, I guess you would say the second official world champion, Emmanuel Lasker. And he had a very famous quote within the chess community. He said that, you know, um, basically he said that on the chess board, uh, lies and hypocrisy don't survive. You know, uh, that, that, that chess is really, you know, a place where truth kind of reigns supreme. And I think a lot of chess players um, see their chess as, as very much a pursuit of, um, of pursuit of truth. Um, and the reason that I think it's a lot like a language is because it's very, you know, there's a structure to it. There's a structure to it. And uh, the younger that you start, you know, um, you, you sort of internalize that structure in the way that you would internalize a native language. Um, it's much harder, you know, um, Th th this is sort of commonly known, and I think there's a lot of truth to it, that it's much harder to learn a language later in life because you're learning it at a much more conscious level. You have to sort of learn the grammar rules and learn the patterns, and you have to do this at a conscious level. Um, whereas when you're learning your native language as a child, you sort of internalize those patterns. You, you might not be able to explain them, but they're intuitive. And I think chess is very much that way, that you know, kids who learn it when they're very, very young, and if they learn it from uh, good models, you know, players who are, uh, you know, uh, playing correctly, so to speak, playing, you know, high quality chess, then they're going to internalize that. And it's just going to become like second nature to them. Uh, very often, they're not necessarily good teachers of chess, because they can't articulate and put into words exactly why, uh, you know, they, they're um, uh, making the moves that they do. Um, just as we can't always explain why we express ourselves using certain combinations of words rather than others, and we don't, we don't necessarily know the underlying rules of the grammar that's guiding our speech. Um, um, but nevertheless, right, if it's our native language, we're doing it very well. So to me, chess is very much in that vein. And I, I think that goes back to why it is such a difficult thing to lose. And that's really a big part of the show is that her pain and her, her, the, the trouble she has accepting defeat. And I think it's really because, you know, you've put so much of yourself into this and you, um, to you, it's a, it's a form of self-expression. It's like your language. Um, and it's, you're, you know, searching for the right move, I think in a lot of ways, is like searching for the right word when you're speaking is sort of how I think of it. You know, and, and, and there's a real sense of validation uh, you know, when you win, it's almost as if you've, you've created a poem, you know, you've, you've, you've said what you wanted to say, just as you wanted to say it, and it's been recognized objectively. And I think that's something that's very powerful, has a very, very, very powerful psychological appeal to it. Um, and when you lose, it, you know, it's not just that you've lost a game. Um, it's that, you know, you 
you had a concept, you had a, a vision that you were trying to articulate, that you were trying to express through the game. Um, you know, this thing that you've put, you know, for people who are very deep into it, they've put decades into it, they've put their lives into it, they've studied it, they've studied its history, and they have a, be a belief about, um, you know, about it and about, about what they're saying and about what they're trying to communicate um, through it. Because the third, the third prong to me, I was going to say, it's, it's a philosophy, it's sort of like philosophy, it's sort of like language. And the other, the other thing that to me it really compares to is art as a form of self-expression. And in fact, um, for anybody who um, knows art, then I'm sure if, you, if you're into the art, um, art history, then you, you know it better than me because I'm a real amateur there. But I do remember that I took a couple of art history classes in college. And um, there's a very famous artist by the name of Marcel Duchamp, who apparently for people who are sort of very high up in the art community, he is considered um, on a par, if not, if not even a, a leg above, um, this is how I was taught, a leg above Salvador Dali in terms of um, founding Dadaism and, and Cubism and things of that nature. Um, and Marcel Duchamp uh, was, um, uh, was a sort of national level French uh, French national level chess player. He competed in the French national championships. Um, and he has a very famous saying that's known, well known in the chess community, which is that, you know, not all artists obviously are chess players, but all chess players are artists. Um, and, and, you know, I think he meant it. Um, um, yeah, good question uh, about the, uh, the relatively unknown player. I'm going to address that. Um, So I'm um, just getting back to this thing about what is what is chess, uh, you know, and I think it's it's a it's a linguistic uh, uh, similar to language, you know, to language. It's similar to art and it's similar to philosophy. And I think that that's why in the, the show, one of the big themes is the sort of pain of defeat and the intensity of it, I think, comes from those comes from those factors. Uh, there's a real sense that you're not being validated, you know, um, when you lose a chess game. Uh, so and, and these chess games are very long also. Um, that's another thing that you've, you've put in so many hours in, into the game. Um, okay. You know, so real quick, because I'm not yeah. sure people really have a paradigm. Do you want to mention how long your typical games are? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it varies. Um, it does vary based on, you know, people's, um, um, you know, uh, style and approach uh, and, and sort of what they're going for. But a, what, what, what most people consider a serious chess game, which we would call a classical chess game, um, will run from anywhere from between about four to seven hours. And that's actually been greatly shortened. I mean, actually, you know, chess, it used to be um, during the time period that the Queen's Gambit is sort of depicting, uh, the games, as you see in the show, the games would often get adjourned, which means they wouldn't finish in one sitting. And then there would be an overnight session where people would try to uh, figure out the best moves and then they would resume the game and, and play maybe another several hours the next day. So there is a trend in chess of it getting shorter, but to, to the average audience who doesn't know chess at all, I think that the fact to hear that you could play one game of chess and for it to take six, seven hours is astonishing. Uh, personally, this is just me, uh, everybody's different, but my games do tend to run uh, the full amount of time. And generally, if you play in a chess tournament, you're playing uh, two games per day which means that very often what happens is I'll walk into the building at let's say eight in the morning and I'll be sitting at the chessboard for anywhere between 12 and 14 hours. And when I'm done, uh, my mind is a, you know, a puddle and uh, you know, it's all dark <laughs> um, and the day is gone. And this is one other element of the chess uh, that I wanted to talk about that I thought was very interesting about the Queen's Gambit that I think I've never seen really depicted well anywhere else. Um, and I'll talk about the fitness too. It's a good question. Um, which is, I think that chess players perceive time quite a bit differently <laughs> than other players. Part of this is the fact that, you know, you're interacting with this intergenerational thing where you're interacting with people of all different ages all the time. And so you don't, uh, so that's one element of it. And then the fact that, you know, you do something that could take, you know, you could play a chess game in five minutes if you wanted to, um, but instead you've put seven hours into it. And so you're sitting there for 30 minutes, for 40 minutes, and maybe only one or two moves have been played in that time. Maybe not even. There, have, there, are, there are plenty of times where strong chess players will take 30 minutes and not even make a single move. Uh, and so to the outside observer, nothing is happening. But of course, um, as the player yourself, while you're thinking on the move, to you, you actually feel rushed. 
you know, you're trying to figure out all these things and your time is ticking away. And so a half hour might feel like, like nothing to you. Um, but again, to an outside observer, it feels like a long time. And so I'm just going to tell you my favorite uh, scene in the show, The Queen's Gambit, which is, um, I've heard a lot of people talk about The Queen's Gambit. In fact, the current world champion, Magnus Carlsen, if you go on YouTube, he also uh, has a little video where he talks about his reaction to The Queen's Gambit. And he answers some of these questions from his perspective uh, that I've seen in the chat about fitness and about some other things. Uh, but my favorite uh, scene in The Queen's Gambit was actually the scene, I don't know if you remember it, where she runs into... Um, her high school, the girl that sort of um, was her acquaintance in high school, who she sort of had a grudge against. And, you know, this is many, many years later, she runs into her in the department store. And she feels very awkward because to her, their relationship is just the same as it always was, you know, uh, which is that this girl sort of uh, was mean to her and was not a very friendly person. But when she brings up the incident, um, this girl who's now a, a mother and has a baby, and her mind is obviously, you know, in a completely different place you know, developmentally and just doesn't remember uh, and, and is not thinking that way. Um, but, but to me, that was a really telling scene because I think, you know, the way the chess community works is, you know, the folks that I was interacting with when I was eight years old are still the same people 30 years later, many of them that I'll still see when I go to a chess tournament. And so it's sort of this itinerant community who, you know, who keeps sort of popping up everywhere you go. Um, and in many ways, they don't, they don't, they'll treat you the same way when you're eight years old as when you're 38 years old. Um, and so there's this very strange kind of thing that goes on there where they're not really adjusting for your developmental, um, you know, your developmental changes. Um, okay, let me try to get to some of these questions. So um, uh, I see, I, I don't know which order I should go in. Have you ever witnessed a basic unknown player make such a splash like in the Queens? I'm really glad you asked that. I'm actually reading a wonderful book right now by Stuart Rachels. <laughs> so I can recommend somebody else's book. When I was in college, I majored in philosophy, as I mentioned at Amherst. One of the philosophers that really impressed me at that time was a man named James Rachels, who wrote an article about cultural relativism, which is, you know, basically the question of if different cultures have different ethical beliefs, then is there any way to adjudicate, you know, between these different beliefs? And I was really impressed with that article. It's very, it's actually very easy to read. I thought, you know, for a philosophy article, you can find it online. I think it's it's called something, if you search the cultural relativism by James Rachels, he's a very well-known philosopher. Um, and um, what I didn't know is that his son, whose name is Stuart Rachels, uh, who is also now a philosophy professor, um, he was basically what you would say is an unknown player. If you say Stuart Rachels to a lot of chess players, a lot of chess players don't know who Stuart Rachels is. But Stuart Rachels won the 19, I don't remember what it was, 1989 perhaps, United States Championship in chess. He was the United States champion, co-champion in 1989. And he was uh, selected, I think, because the championship took place, you know, sometimes they'll select a local player in these big tournaments, you know, in, uh, near the hometown of wherever they have the tournament. So it's kind of like a local hero, um, you know, so they'll have all these famous chess players descend upon some town. And then they'll have a local player who nobody's ever heard of, you know, uh, relatively speaking, unknown. And they'll say, you can come play in this tournament. It's a great opportunity. So Stuart Rachels was the one who was selected, the son of this famous philosopher who I'd read in college. And he ended up winning, <laughs> uh, winning the tournament um, and becoming the, the, I think it was the 1989 US champion. And he has written a book called The Best, I've, uh, the Best I Saw in Chess, which is very recent. And I was reading the book. And at the time that I started reading the book a few months ago, I didn't know that he was related to James Rachels. I had no idea. But one thing that really impressed me about the book is the only chess book I've ever read where he was talking about something that I had seen a lot as a chess organizer, which is a lot of adults, as I mentioned, this sort of intergenerational quality. There were a lot of adults who you know, have a very big influence on these children because they're their coaches or they're their mentors, and, but they're not very ethical people, unfortunately. Uh, when I took students to the national championship, I ran into a, a team and I'm, you know, obviously not going to name names or point, point fingers or anything, but there was a team and they cheated and I confronted their coach about it. And their coach knew that they weren't going to get caught. And, they, and he told me flat out, he said, yeah, that's how we do it. That's how we do it. He just admitted it straight out. Um, and we ended up getting, I think we got third or fourth place that year, but we would have been uh, second or first place. But that's what the coach told me, that that's what we do. Um, and Stuart Rachel's in the book. He said that his coach was doing that, you know, he said that, um, and it wasn't ethical that he was when he would go to play in children's tournaments, his coach, you know, who he liked, you know, and he was a kid and he, he was, his, he said he was his friend and he was a friend of the family, um, but he told him to cheat, you know, he, he, he made him cheat. 
Um, and I was thinking to myself, that's so unusual in a chess book for somebody to come at it from an angle of ethics. And then I said, well, who is this person? And the more I looked into it, it turned out that it was the son of this philosopher who's written on ethics. So it sort of made sense to me. Um, but Stuart Rachel is very interesting. So that kind of uh, first person that I thought of when you said somebody who comes out of nowhere. But when I started, when I, um, when Melvin and I started the chess club of Fairfield County, one of the things that I think is really special about it, and again, I, I appreciate that Dana said that, I do think it's very unique in the United States for many, many reasons. But one of the, the reasons that, um, that, that Melvin was, uh, who runs the club now, okay, and who determines the culture of the club there, and who did at the time when we started it, is that he is somebody for whom ethics is paramount. You know, he, as I mentioned, you know, he, he's um, somebody who um, grew up in that community, is well known in that community, has devoted his life to that community. But for him, um, you know, um, being ethical is extremely important. And that's, that, that's something that runs throughout the entire culture of the club. And I think that we have a lot of mentorship opportunities at that club for children, um, just as you, know, you see a lot of adults and children interacting in the chess community. But what I think is very unique is that it's done in, a, you know, in an ethical and uh, developmentally healthy and appropriate way. Um, so I think that's really important. OK. Um, it's much easier to be deal with being outrun or out swam or out muscled than being out thought. It's, it's being, yes, it's like being out human. Yes, I think that's right. I think that's part of why it, it hurts so much. It really, it really is, um, you know, it, it really is personal. It's really personal in a way that, um, you know, you really feel that you're expressing a part of yourself and, and, and that it's, it's not heard and it's not validated when you lose. And so often it's the case that in chess, it's a very merciless game in the sense that it, you know, you, there, there's no, um, um, there's no, there's no, um, you know, the, the result at the end is the only thing that's understood by the larger audience. Whereas you could be playing for seven hours and for all of those seven hours, uh, you could be doing fantastic, wonderful things that really deserve a lot of attention and deserve a lot of praise. And they might even deserve more praise than, uh, you know, the one thing that, that ended up causing the result of the game at the end. Um, but, but of course, all of the adulation goes to the winner. Um, and I think that, that, you know, for those who know the bigger story, that that's often very painful and difficult to deal with. Um, okay, so... How do you cheat in chess? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, in, for Stuart Rachel, it was this, it was as simple as you know you're allowed to get up from the board. Nobody can force you to sit there for seven hours straight. That would be inhumane. So you are allowed to leave during the during the game itself. Now, of course, you know if um, if the culture were different, then there would be ways in which you know um, cheating would be more difficult. But one of the things that I think is is unfortunate about chess culture is that you know it's it's not. Um, uniformly, there's not consistent, you know, there's pockets of places where it's done better and pockets of places where it's done worse, um, but it's not really given a lot of attention. There's not, there's not really an incentive to be ethical. And so it's a simple lot of cases as the child will leave and then the adult will come up to them and just tell them, this is what you should do. You should go here, you should do that. Um, all right, um, I have um, some questions I just don't wanna miss. Do you have a fitness regimen to train for chess? Um, this is something that, you know, because you're sitting there for seven hours or 14 hours, and it might be multiple days at a time, there was a very famous cases in world championship matches where people became sick from playing so long, you know, because it is a phenomenal mental exertion. Um, and there were cases where people were rushed to the hospital in the middle of the game. And there have even been cases where people have died during the game at the chessboard. Um, so it is... Uh, it's hard to believe if you're not um, sort of in it, but one, but 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 it has happened enough that um, it, it is important to be physically, uh, in, you know, healthy. Um, okay. To what extent has technology changed the landscape? That's a great question. Um, technology has changed it enormously, um, but it's a little bit paradoxical in the sense that you know there, there's a French saying, right? The more it changes, the more it stays the same. Um, you know, chess is 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 a game of detail. So in order to appreciate the, the changes, I think you have to really be in the know. If you were to look at chess games, and you know, one of the wonderful things about chess is that it has a recorded history of several hundred years. Um, and so you can go back and you can look and see what were people doing back in 1700 in France when they would play chess. Um, and in some ways, uh, sort of superficially, uh, sometimes a lot of these things look the same. And you know, if you're a historian, you know that history repeats itself and history rhymes. And very often there are, um, choices of moves that were very popular back in the 1700s. And then people in the 1800s just say, that's no good. You know, the, those, those are, um, you know, uh, you know, we've learned, uh, you know, what to do since then. And those aren't very good. And we've evolved past that. 
And then you'll find that, you know, 50 years or 100 years after that, people have gone back to it. So there's these very interesting trends and counter trends in chess. Um, but one of the things is that, the, you know, the computer, um, uh, which is able to calculate, you know, billions of positions per second, meaning it's able to foresee consequences, you know, of, of, of different move choices very, very quickly and to produce what it believes to be, you know, your most optimal outcome has really, uh, you know, given humans a lot more insight into, um, you know, the choices they make at the chessboard and what, what, what choices would optimize their chances. And, uh, but, but at the same time, you have to be able to articulate to yourself, there's no way for a human being to process all of that raw data, right? So the way that we process that data is we use metaphor. So this goes back to the language element of it. We use descriptions. Uh, you know, one of the things that, um, the, the, a lot of people consider the greatest chess player of all time. Well, a lot of people consider it to be Bobby Fischer. And then another person who gets a lot of attention, who's sort of well known uh, today, even internationally for his um, other work outside of chess is Gary Kasparov. He's a contributing, I think, writer to the Wall Street Journal. He's even uh, been mentioned in Barack Obama's uh, recent book. Uh, his name came up several times. Um, and so you may have heard of him. Um, and Gary Kasparov lost the world championship ultimately in the year 2000 to Vladimir Kramnik. And what Vladimir Kramnik did was he sort of brought back something from hundreds of years ago, a, a sort of weapon that hadn't been used because people thought that it wasn't any good because they thought, well, we've seen what happens when you do that, that doesn't work out well. But because he was able to work with the computer, um, he was able to notice a lot of subtle details in that, in that web, you know, to sort of um, upgrade that weapon in a way that nobody had uh, foreseen. Um, but, but the reason I bring this up here is because that weapon is called the Berlin Wall. Now, obviously, <laughs> when you say, well, what is it? Is it a wall? Is it, is it in Berlin, right? Uh, it's neither of those things. It's just a series of chess moves, right? But what we do in chess is we have these metaphors that we use, right? So that our mind can, can process what to a computer is just ones and zeros, right? It's just numbers, just computer language. But because human beings don't process data that way, we process it through metaphor. We process it through telling ourselves a story, Right, what we call making a plan in chess, which is really sort of constructing a narrative about what's happening at the chessboard. And it's a way of, uh, on a very practical level, it's a way of maintaining interest in the game. A lot of people lose because they just get bored <laughs> during the game, they fall asleep. Uh, but part of that is because they're unable, their, their linguistic ability is unable to tell themselves a story, this is my opinion, that they can no longer tell themselves a story about what's happening in the game that's of interest to them. And so their mind sort of shuts off. So one thing is very practical is just keeping your mind engaged for hour after hour after hour. But the other thing is about the, the better chess players, the chess players who are more successful are uh, sort of deeper into the details, right? So every word, every motion, you know, they have some way of conceptualizing it that maintains their interest, that tells them a story, and that helps them remember it and, and conceptualize it in a way that has some kind of human logic to it. Um, okay, so sorry. Okay. That was so I think you and I, since we have about eight minutes left and we have yeah. about probably 10 great questions that could take an hour each. Yeah. We should blitz. I'll shoot questions at you and we'll blitz, you answer. Okay, let's do it. What's your favorite opening? Um, that really varies depending on the situation. Um, I, I like, I, I, I consider myself, I try to play the right moves. Uh, the moves that I think are, um, you know, principled moves. So I, I, I try to play um, the Spanish game, which has been around for a long time, very historied. Um, you know, I would say the Spanish game this is, is, is one of my favorite openings. Okay. What typical mistakes do chess parents make? And don't mention me by name, please. <laughs> uh, yeah, so one thing I think is, um, uh, the, other, the other thing I didn't get to mention, but I think is very important, is that I think it's very important, you know, just like when you go to a college or a university, they spend a lot of effort on, you know, the architecture and making sure that these are places of learning that reflect uh, the grandeur of what they're doing. I think that's important. I think there's value to that. And I think that too often in chess, uh, you know, uh, we allow ourselves to be in spaces that are very dirty. Um, this may have something to do with, you know, it being male dominated. Uh, as you mentioned, but if you watch Searching for Bobby Fischer, that's a good example of that, that, you know, so often these events, um, you know, people are crammed into the tight spaces um, and people are, uh, you know, I'm talking about the parents as well, you know, they'll bring their children, we'll be playing chess, but then they'll be packed into, you know, uh, you know, on the floor, you see them sitting in public schools or in, you know, uh, public spaces that are dirty, that are unclean. Um, and I don't think that, that sends a good message to the wider chess, uh, you know, to the wider community about chess and about, you know, um, integrity and, and, and the value that we place on it. And so one of the things that I think was really important about when we started the club, Melvin and I, 
uh, is that we had a place that I thought brought some dignity to what we were doing. Um, and it wasn't a place of charity. You know, it was a place that was created by chess players for chess players. Um, and, and so I think that, you know, parents, you know, I understand, I, you know, I see it from both sides. I mean, I understand that, you know, why would you want to pay, you know, um, you know, uh, $15 for something you could get for $10. But I do think it's important, you know, that um, you know, this is my view that, you know, um, sometimes we have to pay for things to, you know, um, have things that are, that are of quality. Um, and, uh, and so, so yeah, I think, I think that we could all do but contribute to that and, and make a nicer community. Nice. What traits do people have that end up being great chess players? And I think you've kind of said this, but just bang a few out. Yeah. Um, one of the nice things about chess is that there's many roads to Rome. There's many ways to be successful, I think, in chess. Um, you know, I'm only able to share the things that I think, you know, help me, um, uh, which I hope, hope I've been able to mention. Um, you know, uh, there was a great chess world champion named Botvinnik who, who considered chess to be a science and he researched it very, very deeply. I think that having an ability to research. I think patience is probably the most important thing. And ability to be self-critical is very important. There's no way to improve in chess if you're not willing to look at yourself and look at your own uh, mistakes and really and really be critical with yourself and not, not take it personally, so to speak, but to say, hey, look, you know, I need to get better. I need to learn, you know, the way my mind works is, is currently bringing me at this level. And so I need to expand, you know, the way my mind works. Um, and I think people who try to take shortcuts around that by, you know, um, you know, moving faster or doing, you know, or, or something like that, um, they end up in the long run, not really making the kind of progress that is um, really substantial. Okay. How do you explain how chess has endured for so long? I think the fact that it has a recorded history um, where we can, you know, it's very much like the history of art or the history of anything where you're, you're really becoming part of a historical community, then that you can contribute to uh, you know, to, to, to it. You know, I think a lot of artists and a lot of poets, you know, who are successful, um, I don't think it's a coincidence that they are able to name their predecessors, they're able to name their inspirations, they're able to build off of the work that's come before it. So I think the fact that, you know, chess is, is like that in that sense, that you're not just sitting down, you know, and playing a game like, you know, that, that you don't know anything about, but you're really part of uh, a longer story, a part of a history that is also global, you know, that, 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 you know, you're part of the whole world has contributed to this, this, um, this story that chess has told, you know, since its beginning and that it, and that chess is really a reflection of the human mind, you know, at work, you know, how, how, how human mind solves problems and how it creates beauty and how it's done that in different time periods through different cultures. So I think being a part of that is a part of something bigger, maybe is, is why is part of why it's endured. Okay. Um, and this is different from the question before. I'm teaching my seven-year-old grandson to play. I'm learning at the same time. Is there a best first opening move that I can teach? Yeah, I think the best thing that you can do as your first step would be to head over to the chess club of Fairfield County, especially if you're in Southport. Um, that would be the best opening move. Um, uh, but on the chessboard itself, um, you know, uh, Bobby Fisher had a funny uh, saying that became famous. He said that he played pawn to king four and he said that that was best by test. Um, you know, but I, I think that it's really not about one move, you know, one move isn't going to get you very far. Um, there's more, you know, possible chess positions. This is, this is a sort of a known thing than atoms in the universe that's been estimated. So playing one move correctly is not going to really get you there. But again, it's about how you conceptualize your moves, what kind of story you tell yourself. And I think that, uh, the kind of community that you become a part of, I think is, is very important, um, is sort of bringing you up. Um, through chess, so um, I would recommend you, you check out the chess club if you have a if you and your and your and your son you know want to learn something together or your daughter. I think that that would be a really wonderful place to to do that. Okay, we're going to try and get to three questions in two minutes. I don't know. Yeah. Um, ha has the population of strong players increased or decreased over the last ten years? I, my understanding is that's increased uh, pretty significantly. I mean, the fact that um, it's much more democratic, you know, when it was Soviet dominated, which it was for a long time, um, and you see this in the show, The Queen's Gambit, there was a, a sort of a, um, a culture of secrecy in some ways where the Soviets would keep keep information to themselves. Now, of course, with the internet and the, and the engines that analyze chess, um, you know, it's much more democratic. The world champion now is from Norway. And, uh, you know, there's players from all over the globe have access to uh, you know, equal, almost equal access to information, which makes it a lot more democratic. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm going to jump to the last one just in case. I'm not really sure if we're going to actually get cut off at seven or not. 
Um, how do people get in touch with you or get a signed copy of your book? And maybe you could actually type something into yeah, it's very easy. Um, you go to the uh, fairfieldcountychess.com, which is the uh, club website, but you can um, get in touch. Uh, you can purchase my book there and you can also get in touch with, um, uh, with folks who can put you in touch with me. So very easy. Great. Um, thank you. What personal skills of yours have improved from playing chess? Um, I think, as I mentioned, the ability to be critical of myself without, you know, taking it personally. I think that's important in a lot of fields. The ability to think deeply, the ability to have patience. I think all of those things uh, have been improved through chess. Okay. Um, do we have time for three quick questions, Christine? Yes. Okay. What is meant by players who are killers at the board? Um, so I think that there, there is this um, difference in the way that people approach chess. Um, and, you know, some, some analysts have sort of broken it into different psychological profiles. Of course, those are, you know, they're rather wide ranging and cover a, a range of people. But, but my understanding is that the killer profile is folks who really all their, their only interest is, is in winning. <laughs> and, and almost to, 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 to this, to this, um, to, to the extent that they don't care about anything else. You know, there was a famous chess player who almost became world champion, actually, whose father once threatened his opponent's life. You know, he said, if you, if you beat my son, I'm going to end your life. And he, he had some connections to, I think, the Russian mob. So that's an extreme case, <laughs> right? But that's a very literal term when you say killers. But I do think there are sort of people like that who, and, and that's, of course, outside the chessboard. But I think there are people who, you know, they can try to, uh, you, you know, they're not interested in the historical record. You know, they're not interested in um, playing something that is that is beautiful that's going to bring joy to anybody um they just want to make you you know win in, uh, however they can uh, i think that that's you know a killer <laughs> i would i would mention just really quickly to anyone who doesn't know that there's often thousands of dollars on the lines these games more than ego but i'm going to give you two quick questions has there ever been an outstanding female chess player Okay, I was going to insist on answering that anyway. Um, one of the most inspirational moments in my career, in my chess life, I would say, is um, when I played Judith Polgar. Judith Polgar is the actual inspiration for Beth Harmon. Uh, she was the greatest chess, female chess player to ever live. Uh, she's still alive. Uh, she also talks on YouTube about, about the show, and she talks with the actress who portrays Beth Harmon. You can check that out on YouTube. Her name is Judith, J-U-D-I-T-H. Polgar, she's from Hungary, and um, she did a simultaneous exhibition, which viewers of the show will be familiar with. That's when one player plays many, many players at the same time. And I was uh, in one of her simuls when I was a child. And, um, you know, I had prepared, I looked at all of her games, and I had prepared a line, and I played the line, and I got an even position, and I offered her a draw, um, and she accepted the draw. Now, when she accepted the draw, you know, I took that as a massive boost of confidence, and that really gave me a lot of um, confidence for, for moving forward for chess because she was extremely famous. And uh, now, 30 years later, I'm, you know, or 20 plus years later, I'm able to look back and understand what really happened, which is that, um, you know, yes, I had played very well up until that point, but of course, there was a lot of game left to play. And if she had wanted to, she could have easily won the game. Um, but she did something very gracious, which was she let me have my draw as a kid. And, uh, you know, so that was very nice. But wonderful person, and she's still around, and you can check her out. Okay, so the last question that I see, and if I missed any, I'm going to ask people to just quick retype them, although I know we have to wrap up too. I think I got them all. This one's, uh, don't know how to take this one, but Daniel, have you ever thought about retiring from competitive chess? Yeah, uh, it's a good question because like I said, um, you know, uh, and actually there's a lot of history about the great players and why they retire and when they retire and when they make a comeback and it's very interesting. You know, chess is something that I think that's one thing that's very nice about it is that it kind of sticks with you for your whole life and, and you can have it for your whole life. And then the other thing that's, uh, that that goes with that is that, you know, you're going to have your periods where you're more into it and, and, and not as into it. You're feeling, uh, as I mentioned, you know, many times and you see it in the show, right? When you lose, it can be very deflating for a lot of people. That's, that's an exit moment. And then sometimes people come back or they, you know, they come back for periods. So I think it really varies for different people. I think everybody has thought about it. Um, you know, when, it, when, when, if there's no longer joy or you don't feel like you're growing anymore, or you feel stagnant. Uh, those are times where, but I would suggest that those are times where, you know, you want to find a way to renew and rejuvenate your interest. And uh, again, I think a, uh, I would direct you to the chess club. I think being, because I think being part of a culture of people who love it and who do it for the love and there's a mentorship program there. That's wonderful. And being part of a community, I think, is important 
um, to keep that love alive and to keep some perspective on, on, on the whole thing. Excellent. Well, I'm, I guess I'll let Christine wrap it up, but I'd like to thank the Pequot Library for hosting this as well as all the amazing Meet the Author that they have. I'd really like to thank you, Daniel. I mean, it's nice for me to be able to see you since I haven't. Thank you. I, you? I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Christine? Yeah. Thank you so much, Dana. And thank you, Daniel. This was really wonderful. Um, it's really great to learn some uh, new chess things. I didn't know that much about chess, but now I feel I know a little bit more about it. So thank you. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, have a good evening. Bye guys. Thank you.